Hello, hello, welcome back. Let's talk about Mr. Impossible. No, not that Mr. Impossible. This Mr. Impossible. It's the latest in the Dreamer trilogy by Maggie Stiefvater. And I know I'm a little bit late getting into talking about this book. There are reasons for that, so let's get into it. When it comes to writing, Maggie has never disappointed me. The words just flow so naturally and poetically, both on the page and when read aloud. It's a real treat to listen to any of the books from the Raven Boys universe. Having a third person point of view that alternates between characters really serves the story and the narrative well. It allows us to get into as many heads of characters as we possibly can, which allows us to collect as much information as we possibly can, even if some of the points of view are less reliable than others. But it allows us to form our own thoughts and our own opinions, so whose side are we on and where do we stand? Every character is defined. You can tell that she absolutely loves every single one of her characters. You can just tell by the way that they speak, or the way that they move, or the way that they simply exist in a space. This book is by far not one of Maggie's strongest books, but she said it herself when this book was coming out that either we would love the book or we would hate the book. And the vast majority of the fandom seems pretty damn split on that. But once again, I find myself standing a bit outside of all of that because I didn't hate it and I didn't love it. For me, the book was kind of meh. It was a joining point. The one thing that I praised, her ability to swap in and out of characters, the each one has a very distinctive taste, is still something that kind of tugs at me. There are so many characters and there are so many points of views that sometimes you just feel a little disjointed. It leaves you a little confused and grasping at something solid, something that will connect you when we're bouncing around so many different storylines. Everything in the story is connected, but at the same time is separate, so it makes it difficult to orient yourself in the story, and then you're suddenly jerked out abruptly with a shift. But for the first time when reading any of the books in these series, I found myself bored. No, 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 that's not the right word. It's just that so much time is spent in transit, but nothing really happens. A lot of the time the characters just sort of feel aimless and directionless. Usually the problem I have is that I can't put a book down, but in this case I found myself struggling to pick the book back up. I was just less enthralled and eager for the story. It could be partly due to the pace, or it could be due to the fact that there are several characters that we don't really get to see interactions of, or it could be that some of the scenes just seemed repetitive in nature. Everything was so slowed down, like a constant game of tag, a back and forth between the same parties, but the conflict never really evolved until the very last minute. Like the story had plateaued from the very first chapter and then suddenly spiked in the very last. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. There was action here or there, but nothing really came to a head. It was just a lot of running. Ronan has always been my favorite character and I was absolutely ecstatic when he, I found out he was getting his own series. Because we got to better understand him, we got to better understand his abilities, and better understand this divide in the worlds that he lives in. I absolutely love to call down the hawk, but Mr. Impossible? I could have taken or left. I was far more invested in some of the smaller characters, like Matthew or Declan or Jordan. Not just their relationships with each other, but in their growth and development. I liked that they were changing. I liked who they were becoming. Matthew is struggling to reconcile what it means to be a dream and what it means to be real. It's a teenager struggling with personal autonomy and existence and relevance. Everything that he's feeling is exactly the same thing you feel when you're going through adolescence. His just happens to be exacerbated by the fact that he is a dream. It's an identity crisis within an identity crisis. He's still learning to be a person, which is something that we can all relate to. The idea of what makes us real, what makes us a person, what makes us who we truly are. 
Jordan has always lived with the understanding that she is a dream, but at the same time has always felt that she could never be anything more than a forgery. But she's given the sudden opportunity to pursue her own life, to pursue her own goals, to form her own identity. She's no longer solely a forger. She has the opportunity to create something original. Even Declan's stepping up. Yes, he's still torn between wanting to protect his family and wanting to create a new life for himself. But he's trying to find balance. He's trying to learn. For the first time in his life, he's actually allowing himself to want something for himself. I was definitely more interested in the character of Farouk laying in the previous book than I am in this one. I was excited to see where her character was going to go, and yeah, she's made this huge decision, one that is possibly life-altering for the entire world. But there's just something about her, something that I can't put my finger on, something I can't verbalize. However, we do have the intriguing potential romance between her and Liliana. So how will that shape our future? How will it shape the world's future? How is it going to change her perspective, and how will her goals and attitudes change too? And then we have Hennessy and Lace. A literal, physical representation of her deepest fears and trauma. Something that was created from the damaged psyche of a neglected and abused child. One that is terrified that she's forgettable, that people will abandon her, that Jordan's already abandoned her. But at the same time, she feels worthless. Like, she's nothing more than a forger. I do appreciate that she feels she needs to take responsibility for herself, for her dreams. It's this concept in the story of we need to be responsible for what we bring into the world. Whether this is your actions or your choices. It's something that Bride repeats over and over again in the story. Ronan didn't appear to have a goal for the vast majority of the book. Declan calls him a follower, and he's definitely not wrong. Ronan definitely has this obsessive codependent streak. We've seen it again and again, book after book, with Yanzi, with Kavinsky, with Adam, with Bride. I'm hoping that in the next book, Ronan really has the opportunity to come into himself, to really develop as a person and become a leader. It's understandable, though. He just wants to be less alone in the world. It's the reason that he's dreamed himself a brother or a mentor. He wants somebody that can understand him, and it's something we can trace back all the way to Kavinsky. He has been betrayed, even if accidentally. But everybody that he has trusted and that he's loved has seemingly turned their back on him. But at the same time, he's been purposely keeping them at an arm's length. Which has forced his family, both blood and found, to react in ways that both endangers him and themselves and everybody around them. Adam is so desperate not to lose Ronan that he's going to lose himself. He's been traumatized growing up. But he seems to be following in the footsteps of Declan. He's trying to live this life that he thinks will make him happy rather than just living the life that will make him happy. I know lots of people are very disappointed about the lack of interaction between Adam and Ronan, but I just said it. They both need to learn to live for themselves. Ronan needs to learn to become his own person before he can become somebody that others can depend on. What I am most curious about in Mr. Impossible is this concept of a sweet metal. Though I am kind of curious about the naming of it, it just... I don't like it. It feels off in my mouth, sweet metal. But the idea of an emotion and connection, like the love and devotion to a piece of art, so much so that we keep a dream alive, it just fascinates me. It makes me wonder if we've actually come across one before in the previous series. When I think back on it, just the way that Gansey's 
journal is described and discussed, it's a possibility. I'd have to go back and reread the series again to see if I could really pick up on anything, though. Overall, it's a book. It's a book with no real closure. Everything is just left open, and we're left dangling on the edge of a monster cliffhanger. Which is actually pretty typical of a middle book, which is usually the darkest, with the most left on the line. And it also explains the dragging feel of this book. There's a lot to like about this book, and there's a lot that's going to bug the hell out of you. But it's a bridge. It's a bridge that's hopefully going somewhere. And honestly, I can't wait to reach the destination. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.